Okay, so Euclidean domains. Um, so we're going to see what a norm is. Uh, we've kind of um, had an idea about what a norm is. Like we've seen this before. Um, but yeah. So you have a function um, that goes from um, a ring to sorry. You have a function that goes from the integral domain r to um, the positive integers with including the zero. Okay. So um, this is a function, and if you fix the zero so that n of zero is equal to zero, and this is going to be a norm of the integral domain. So essentially, it just gives you uh, a positive integer for some um, something in the integral domain. Right, and if your integral domain for something is greater than zero, then um, we define n to be um, a positive norm. Right? So, um, your integral domain is going to be a Euclidean domain, um, or possess a division algorithm. So, if you know what uh, the Euclidean division algorithm is, I know just. Uh, it's nothing really, just playing with the quotient and, and remainders to get uh, a number. Um, so that's what will, that, that's it, that is the, that is what makes it Euclidean. Right? So, um, so it's said to be a Euclidean domain if there is a norm n on the integral domain such that uh, when you take two elements a and b of the Euclidean, so the integral domain uh, with b non zero, there exists Q and R in the integral domain such that you can write A in terms of Q B plus R. And essentially, if you could apply uh, the Euclidean division algorithm to any two elements in the integral domain, then it's going to be um, an Euclidean domain, right? And your conditions are straightforward. Um, R is either zero or um, the norm of R must be less than the norm of B. So this is similar to how um, you know we say um, R must be um, less than B, but greater than or equal to uh, the greater than A. Okay, so um, Q is the quotient and R is the remainder, of course. Um, if you be previously familiar with how uh, the division algorithm works, um, it's nothing too um, difficult. You just uh, write uh, this down for successive um, integers. So what you do is you have a, um, which you can write as q zero p plus r zero, and what you do is you take this p and write it as q one r zero plus r one, uh, getting another remainder. Uh, and another quotient, um, then you write R0 as Q2 R1 plus R2, getting another remainder and another quotient, and you do this repeatedly until you have um, the last noise remainder after which you cannot, uh, you know, cannot continue this algorithm without, uh, without uh, deviating from this condition. So, um, this is uh, the condition for the Euclidean um, domain, right? and yeah, so we have, uh, I mean, the trivial example for Euclidean domains are you know, fields, of course, uh, your integers, uh, um, sorry, the real numbers are uh, the Euclidean domains. But um, the condition is that um, your um, um, you can you should be able to write this um, in terms of the written uh, algorithm, and also uh, you must fix the zero and right? of zero should be zero. And we have a few examples of this. Um, so this one is interesting. If you have a field 
uh, then we have a polynomial ring f uh, of x just like we had v of x um, and this is going to be a collision domain with norm given by um, the degree of the polynomial right or n of v of x so some polynomial gives you the degree of the polynomial um, and the division alg algorithm for polynomials is simply the long division you know just trying to um, divide um, the roots of one, one polynomial with the other with another and continuing this so yeah that long and meticulous uh, method that is um, it's not something that you normally do but yeah so um if we have to prove that this is actually an Euclidean domain, you have to show that um you know the quotients and, and remainders work nicely with the conditions. Um and yeah, and it's given in the next chapter where you have the polynomial rings um discussed uh detail in detail, which we're not going to do um uh, in our course. So yeah. Uh, the other one is also interesting about um, quadratic integers. Remember the O that we discussed and the norm there. Um, so the quadratic integer rings are integral domains with a norm defined by the absolute value of the field norm. Right? So if I go back to that, um, we just find it. So the quadratic integer rings, if you remember, um, you know, it gives you um, this, right? So you have uh, z of uh, root d, so you get uh, all these, um, hmm, all these elements of um, hmm, which form a subring of the quadratic field e of root d. Okay. And then we talked about uh, a specific properties has a field norm as well. Um, yeah. So we're giving that example there. And yeah. So um so when your integral so when this quadratic integer rings, um of course they're integral domains, but uh, the norm is defined by the absolute value of the field norm, right? Uh, so you know, make sure that your um values are not negative. Um but in general your um quadratic integer rings are not equilibrium. Right, with respect to this norm or any other norm, mm -hmm. because um, only when you have the um, absolute value, it's possible to have the Euclidean domains. Otherwise, uh, Euclidean uh, division algorithm, which is necessary for it to be an Euclidean domain, uh, in general, uh, that's not possible. Okay. So um, we see a bit about the Gaussian integer, which we're going to also see later. Um, so Gaussian integers of i. Um, now, your d here is minus one, and d comes from the last time we saw um, the quadratic integer. So, um, so this is an Euclidean domain which, with respect to this norm, which uh, gives you n of a plus i d is equal to a squared plus b squared. Right? So, um, you take two elements of zi, um, alpha and beta, and you know, um, we have the field q of i, 
where you can write um, a fraction of alpha beta by another form of you know, another form, another um, element of this form. You know? So this is R plus SI, and here R is AC plus BD over C squared plus D squared, and we have BC minus AB over C squared plus D squared, and this comes from the fact that alpha is A plus BI, and beta is C plus BI. So we need um, the A squared plus B squared, the sum of two squares on the denominator, and uh, on the numerator, we don't have hmm, AC plus BD. Yeah, and these are um, in Q. Mm -hmm. So the division algorithm, um, you know. So yeah, if you're going to like, if, if you choose an integer p that is, you know, close enough to. Um, R, the rational number R, and Q is uh, an integer closest to the rational number S, and also that when you take the norm of these two, R minus P and S minus Q, uh, the, the maximum you can get is uh, 1 over 2 R. So uh, the division algorithm, um, you can follow that to say alpha can be written as P plus Q I times beta plus gamma. So gamma is again another element from Z of I, okay. and N of gamma is less than or equal to half of N of beta. Right, and this, um, hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you need um, this gamma, and this P and P, so that you can write alpha in terms of it, which is necessary, um, which is more than necessary for us to show that Z of I is the equilibrium. Hmm. So um, we take something called theta to be R minus P plus S minus Q I right? and gamma is equal to uh, beta times beta right? so gamma is again another form another element from Z of I that is beta times beta so beta is a Z of I is beta. so gamma happens to be um, beta times uh, Theta, right? So you have um, alpha minus p plus q r times theta, right? So, um, mm -hmm. Right, so this theta that you have written as r minus p, so this is r minus p plus s i minus q i. Mm -hmm. So this turns out to be r plus s i minus p plus q i, and r plus s i is just alpha over beta. See? 
So R plus SI is alpha over beta minus P plus QI. Um, so this is alpha minus P plus QI times beta over beta. This is beta. So you take beta to the other side, it becomes uh, beta times beta, which is uh, gamma. Does that make sense, or do you want me to write that down? It's just nothing really, you just replace R minus R plus SI with alpha over beta, this thing, and then you just uh, substitute. Okay. So, um, yeah, you got it now? Yeah. There's nothing really in it, you just uh, substitute and it goes. Um, and, uh, so this is, um, this is a Gaussian integer, right? Um, because it is of the form, um, you know, AI, A plus BI. Mm, yeah, okay. And alpha happens to be P plus QI times beta plus gamma. Right? So you just take this to here. So gamma plus P plus QI times beta is alpha. Now, when you apply the norm to theta, you have R minus P squared plus S minus Q squared because that's what the norm does. Uh, it gives you A squared plus P squared. So this is R minus Q squared plus S minus Q squared. And, um, but this, uh, because we said, you know, our mod of R minus P and, uh, S minus Q, uh, both have to be, um, maximum. They can, you know, at max they can be one half. So, you know, R minus P plus S minus Q, Seem to be less than or equal to one over. Uh, seem to be less than or equal to one. Right. Yeah, but we don't need that. We need r minus p whole square plus s minus q whole square. It's going to be less than or equal to one over four plus one over four which is one over four. Um, and then you can apply that n of gamma is equal to n of theta times n of theta. n of theta is at max half, so you're left with n of theta, so n of gamma is less than or equal to one half n of theta. See? And this is what we needed for it to be uh, an Euclidean domain. Right? So this is an Euclidean domain. Um, mm -hmm. But there are, um, there are, um, values for which z of something is not going to be Euclidean with respect to any domain. So z root minus 5, they say, is not going to be Euclidean. And, um, this is also not Euclidean, which you're going to see later when we come back to Gaussian entropy. Um, there are, um, a bunch, yeah, so this is the last example on discrete valuation, which is also, I believe, uh, important. Isn't it? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, they say also that. And discrete evaluation rings also come up, uh, I believe in a yeah. yeah, somehow. So, yeah, let's, let's go to this example, and then we'll go to the propositions relating to Euclidean domains and, um, other things.
sell um um so you have a field k and the discrete valuation on the field is this function uh v uh, which takes you from k with the multiplication to z you want to say something jp i'm sorry there's stuff going on in the background i thought i was muted okay. sorry Okay, so um, a discrete valuation is this function, right, um, which satisfies uh, these three conditions. The first condition is that um, v of a v is equal to v of a plus v of b is uh, a homomorphism uh, from the multiplicative group of non two elements of a, b, c, right? So the multiplicative group of which is embedded, embedded, <laughs> which is underlying the field. Then v has to be surjective, and uh, v of x plus y, v of two elements from the multiplicative group, is uh, must be greater than or equal to the minimum value of the images of those two elements x and y. Okay, yeah? and yeah, so that's a discrete valuation. Like, do you know um the exact problem we talked about or anything else that he mentions about this evaluation there? Uh, it's in problems twenty six and twenty seven from section seven one. Mm -hmm. It's where they first show up. They mention the I don't know if it's the piatic integers or just something related to the piatic integers. Yeah. Can't remember why we care or who cares about piatic integers, but I think it showed up um, or shows up in elliptic curves. Yep. Piatic Somebody integers. cares. Piatic integers <laughs> are the only things you care about from us last year on Monday school. Um. Yeah, I think I first heard about them in the um, movie. We would not see, or maybe we will see some of that in the Or maybe if we do some number two. Or um, okay. So that is the discrete valuation ring. Um, so an integral domain is going to be a discrete valuation ring. Um, if you have this discrete um, valuation um, on this field of fractions, remember the field of fractions we got from our commutative ring. Um, if you can have this function there, um, you know, such that you know R becomes the valuation ring, um, then yeah, but, you know, the, the integral domain is now a discrete evaluation, so a discrete evaluation. Okay, so, uh, for example, uh, if you have the ring R of all rational numbers, whose denominators are relatively prime to a fixed prime to some fixed prime P, um, then it's going to be a discrete evaluation ring contained in Q. Yeah. So it's kind of like kind of having a hard time um grasping the intuition behind this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep, chapter nine of the PI is about discrete valuation. 
but I believe they're gonna get with much more sophistication to be. I don't know, it's kind of similar. Mm hmm, mm hmm, yep, but for example, we have take up this point, then any non zero rational number can be written uniquely in the form q the a times y, where um, a is an integer, and both the numerator and denominator of y are in a relative refined to p. Right, so this is what we got uh, in the example from Dummett. The other example that we have. Uh, is where you have a p of k and x is a dissonant determinant, um, then um, you take a fixed irreducible polynomial. Hmm. You define bf like that, and you can have a vibration ring of bf. And you're also going to have a prime ideal. Uh, you're going to get a local ring with respect to the prime ideal from generated from that. Yeah, some stuff. But yeah, this also, okay, an integral domain uh, is a discrete valuation ring if there is a discrete valuation V of this field of fractions such that A is a valuation ring. Yeah. Oh, it is. So, yeah. Mm hmm. Wait, did they define what a principal ideal is? A principal ideal is one which is generated by a single element. A non zero. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Generated by a single element. So that is principle of false. I think somewhere else they talk about primary ideals and that we haven't learned about. Yeah, we haven't learned about primary ideals, but did they mention it in the last chapter? Not think so. Yeah, you have the finite the generated ideal, you have the principal ideal generated by a single element. Um, and then they talk about prime ideals and stuff. Ah. Yeah, so there isn't a problem, okay. Um, yeah, so it's kind of like they give, they give you a lot of exercises in the exercises, and it's like, and some of the definitions are in the exercises, so you cannot um, skim them, so to skip them. A primary ideal, a uh, proper ideal of a commutative ring is primary whenever. Um, a B belonging to the ideal means A is not in Q. So we, if A B is in the ideal and A is not in the ideal, then B to the N must be in the ideal for some in the ideal. Interesting. Yeah, they also defined radicals in these exercises. Yeah, I told about them in the chat. Um To be honest, I don't think this is a nice way to introduce stuff like in the exercises, but yeah.
So this is our primary deal. I'm not sure if we're going to need it. Okay, so um, every ideal in a uh, Euclidean domain is going to be a principal, right? So every ideal is generated by a single element from the um, Euclidean domain. So if i is any non zero ideal in the Euclidean domain R, then i is generated by this B. Where D is any non-zero element. Um, okay, so if I is not a proper ideal, that is, if it's a zero ideal, then of course it's going to be generated by zero. So there's nothing to prove that um, if D is any other non-zero element or um, minimum norm, it's a minimum norm that um, no, it's Hmm. Okay. So the norm you have from the Euclidean domain over this um, element is minimum. Hmm. So, uh, and this is um, well defined that you have a minimum norm because of the well ordering theorem on um, Z and your norm is up in there. Uh, your norm is taking stuff there, so um okay. Um the ideal generated from D is going to be a subset of I, right? Because uh D is an element of I. Okay. Um then you have to show that i is also a subset of the ideal generated by the um, okay. And to show that, we will use the uh, division algorithm from the uh, fact that this is an Euclidean domain, right? So we write a as q t equals r for this b, and uh, the conditions that we needed are r is equal to zero, or this norm is less than the norm of d. That uh, then R is equal to A minus Q D, uh, and both A and Q D are in Y. Sorry, are in I. So R is going to be also in R. But as R as D is like has the minimum norm as we defined, uh, R can N of R cannot be less than N of D. R is also in I, so N of R uh, is going to be the norm of something in the ideal, uh, which is less than the norm of the and that's not possible, so um, in our arm of the zero, uh, showing that A is equal to QB, uh, which is in the ideal generated by B, and um, thus it must be the um, whole idea of I. Okay, so this uh, shows that every uh, ideal in the Euclidean domain would be um uh, it's going to be a principal idea. So this is important. We have a few examples, again we're not going to go through all of them. The first example says if your uh, R is the um oh JP you're back. Uh, oh, somebody <laughs> cut your power? What the hell? But they said it was a safety inspection. They had to check something with the electric box. Who knows? Okay. Turned it off, turned it back on. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Hope everything's fine. Um, so if your R is the integer polynomials, um, then if you have like um two x um the ideal generated from there of uh, that is not going to be principal um mm, that's why right so if you can find one ideal that is not uh principal the whole ring uh 
cannot be a new collision domain because in a collision domain every um, DL is principal. So that's that's interesting. Okay, so that was um Yeah, so this uh you know this Euclidean algorithm that we're getting in Z and in other domains, um we can this can let us have the G C D because if you remember G C D is very closely related to the um the division algorithm. Mm hmm Okay. So, um, if you have a commutative ring and you have two elements from the ring, uh, and the second one being a non-zero one, so A is going to be a multiple of B if there exists an element X such that you can write A in terms of a product of X and B, right? And in this case, B is going to divide A or will be divided by A, which means B uh height or bar or not a bar so let's pick a b uh, divides a so this is uh, again something typical in elementary number theory but we're just starting to see how you can have this uh, from abstractly just on rings so a gcd of a and b is going to be a non-zero element b such that b divides both a and b and if there is something else that divides both A and B, then the, that something else has to divide D too. Okay? So D is the greatest thing that divides both A and B. Okay? Uh, so, yeah, that's the GCD. Mm -hmm. So B divides A in a ring R if and only if A is an element of the ideal generated by B, if and only if the ideal generated by B, so the ideal generated by A is a subset of the ideal generated by B. This is contained. Um, so if B is any divisor of both A and B, then the ideal generated by B has to contain both. Uh, now, Ideal generated by A and B, and um, of course, if you're working in an uh, Euclidean domain, you're going to have all of this in terms of principal ideas, right? So all of these and um, containment of principal ideas. Okay. So if A and B are non-zero elements in the commutative ring such that the ideal generated by A and B is the principal ideal uh, D, then B is going to be the GCD of A and B, right? So um, um, when you denote this uh, as the GCD of A and B, this actually means is a principal ideal generated by A and B, and that is just the um, Ideal generated by D, which happens to be the DCD, this is the second.
can you hear me? Mm hmm. You hear me? I just thought something happened and my internet got uh, disconnected. No.
ini ini ah oh, okay I'm not sure what happened um give me a second ah oh, this is ridiculous Yeah, make I'll I'll take a minute to restart. Wait. Ah. Hmm, can you still hear me? I guess not. Ah.
Can you still hear me? Yeah, you're a little louder now. Okay, yeah, now I'm back on PC. Uh, okay, this is a disaster. I don't know why this has to happen now, since we have a lot of it. Uh, Hmm, okay. So, we've got a couple more things to do with the Oregon domains. Um, before we get to um, PID. Um, okay, so now, um, because you, you have an integral domain, uh, so you have two elements, B and D prime, that generate the same principal ideal, uh, then, um, if D prime is equal to U times D for some unit of the integral domain, then, um, yeah, essentially, like if d and d prime are both uh, d c d of a and b, then you can write uh, d prime um, as um, u times the other d c d. Okay. So the proof of this is nothing really, uh, we're not going to go to that, but we just, um, like, use the units to, um, to have a relationship between D and D prime. Okay, so, um, if you have R as a Euclidean domain and A and B are non zero elements of R, um, you know, so this is just nothing much but doing the algorithm as you do with integers, but um, on any abstract Euclidean domain. So, in, um, in terms of integers, you of course know that the last. Um, the remainder that you have um, is the GCD of A and B. So the last remainder that you get after uh, you know, doing the algorithm for, um, for A and B. And so Yeah. Um, so, you know, this is the uh, last non zero remainder in the algorithm for A and B, and that makes it the GCD of A and B. And if it is the GCD of A and B, um, you know, D can be written as uh, uh, a linear combination of A and B. So here the linear combination is R linear, right? So it's linear with respect to uh, the ring R. Um, but yeah, it's similar to it's analogous exactly to uh, the linear combination you have in integers. Okay, and uh, the process that they describe is nothing um, too um, unfamiliar. If you've done um, if you did an algorithm, you just know that um, you repeat the process and um, you try to find the quotient and the uh, remainders. Okay. Mm. 
mm -hmm. of this theorem. Um, to be honest, there's something really that seems important to me about this theorem. Um, I mean, it's just rewriting everything you know about algorithm in terms of um, these um, ideals and um, elements of the Euclidean domain that, you know, Mm hmm Problem one and seven was one oh yeah. Yeah, these are the kind of baby problems. Yeah, I mean if you can uh yeah, it's good to like practice this just so that you know you'll get used to using especially the E one oh god. These integers uh, uh looks uh horrible but yeah, you'll have to find the uh Q and R and the previous seventh looks interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I have the P set for next week pretty much ready. Uh, but I'll be um, making some changes to it, especially the fact that I haven't added any optional problems. But since it turns out the optional problems are more interesting than the other problems. I'll uh, um, take a while to add those. Um, so let's see. Um, so this there he gives examples of um, example of this um, in Z with two integers um, A and B as two thousand two hundred and ten and one one three one. So the smallest ideal Z that contains both A and B, that is the ideal generated by A and B, is uh, thirteen Z, right? Um, and we can guess thirteen is the uh, GCD of um, these two integers, right? So. What you do is you do the Euclidean algorithm for 2210, can be written as 1 times 1, 1, 3, 1 plus uh, the remainder of 1 to the 7, 9, then you repeat it with 1, 1, 3, 9, and 1 to the 7, 9, you get this quotient and remainder, then you repeat this with 1079 and 52, you get this, and you're left with this, where you have 13. Um, No, they're not going to be on the P set, uh, unless, um, unless, I mean, um, I mean, if these are going to be in the, on the P set, then, uh, optional problems are going to be the only problems that would be non-optional, in the sense that they will be worth, um, fine. I mean, these problems are not to be scared, but, um, I mean, I mean, they won't take a long time, so you can just, like, do them for, uh, getting a hold of this algorithm and how to use this. So yeah, so this is the algorithm. Hmm. Okay, so, um, yeah. So, there's this interesting thing also related to this algorithm as the Diffentine equation. So this is the first order of Diffentine equation. You have higher orders of this. And, uh, Fermat's theorem is also related to these equations. Um, so you have ax plus dy equals to n, and you have to find what a what x and y, uh, you know, would let you uh, get the n um, by adding a times that those numbers. And use. Ah, so yeah, but you can translate this into the language of ideals. Right, so um, this equation is simply another way of stating that n is an element of the ideal generated by a and b, of course. 
axons, we know that this ideal is generated uh, by D, the GCD. So the principal ideal generated by the GCD is the same as saying N is an element of the ideal by GCD. That is, N is divisible by the GCD. So um, this is an important um, result, not really result, uh, just an important thing about that and the equations that they're only solvable when the GCD of the uh, um, they're solvable in integers x and y if and only if the GCD of a and b is divisible by the uh, value you have here and Okay. So, hmm. They give something about how um, a given integral domain is not a uh, Euclidean domain. Yeah, he cites something uh, with Wilson. I'm not sure if this Wilson is the Wilson who has been. I mean, there is this theorem named by Wilson. But I think that's. Something somewhere else. John Wilson. Mm -hmm. No, oh, so it looks like someone who couldn't do anything with ideals since ideals. Okay, it's 1970. The Wilson theorem is by someone who was from like um, 18th century. So, um, yeah. So for any integral domain, uh, R tilde is this R, um, is this is a multiplicative group. Uh, union the um, zero, right? So this is what we saw in the um, valuation function, right? This is where the valuation ta function takes stuff from. So it's the collection of units of R together with zero. Yeah. So an element of U, sorry, an element U of R minus R tilde is called a universal side divisor. If for every x in the um, integral domain, there is some z uh, in R tilde such that u divides x minus z. Okay, so there is a type of uh, this w way of writing the quotient in Landers with division algorithm for u. Okay? So, yeah. So this is uh, kind of a weak weaker condition than the Euclidean division algorithm. And so the proposition is that if R is an uh, uh, integral domain, but it's not a field, right? So R is a Euclidean domain, then there are universal divisors in R. Right? So um, R is integral, um, but it's not a field, right? But if R happens to be Euclidean, then uh, there are universal divisors of these kinds. Okay. And the proof is pretty straightforward. Right? If R is Euclidean with respect to some norm, uh, then you know um, you take an element U from R minus R tilde uh, of minimal norm, right? So for any X in the uh, integral domain, uh, Euclidean domain, uh, you can write X in terms of Q U plus R because you know um you have R as Euclidean, right? Um, in either case, uh, you know, you can do the same argument as before. Um, the fact that um, you have the minimal, minimal norm of U, so um, U has to be, um, it's like N of U um, is minimal, right? So that means R must be in the um, collection of units, the R tilde making you a 
universal divisor. So I'm not sure where we're going to use this universal divisor, but I believe this is just a counterexample of an integral domain that's not Euclidean. So and uh, the there is this example. Hmm. There are some problems, and we have key ideas. Uh, let's go to this. So, uh, PID is an integral domain in which every ideal is principal, right? So, uh, in the Euclidean domain, uh, every ideal was principal, um, but you know we were not sure if, like. Uh, an Euclidean domain is always an integral domain. Right? Wait. Yeah. Yeah, because there are Euclidean domains uh, that are not integral. Uh, okay. I hope I'm not getting it the other way around. So, a principal ideal domain is. Um, yeah, an integral domain where every idea is principal. So, um, yeah, so principal ideal domains are like another, um, larger kind of structure than the, uh, Euclidean domain. So, Euclidean domains, of course, uh, in their every ideal domain, every integral domain, so Euclidean domains are integral domains where every ideal is principal. But uh, the principal ideal domains are much kind of bit more than that. Hmm. Right. So he brings that up just uh, as a very specific counterexample. I see. Okay. So yeah, we. Have yeah, I don't think I don't sorry. think we need to dig in too much on the universal side divisors in the Dedekind Hassan norms. They're not mentioned anywhere else okay. after this chapter. That's so good. I think he's putting them in just to construct this one counterexample. Yeah, that's very tricky out then. Um. Okay. So we'll skip that. Um. Okay. So, yeah, there are two examples of PIDs, uh, integers uh, Z are PID, right? but uh, Z of X, the polynomial ring, um, it contains non-principal ideals, so it cannot be a PID. Right? So, yeah. Okay, so we have a few more things about uh, GCD and how PI works in a PID. I guess it's not much different, but let's see. So if R is a PID and A and B are non zero elements of R, uh, so D is a generator for the principal ideal generated by A and B, okay, cool. Then D is a uh, GCD of A and B. D can be written as R, the new combination of A and B, um, and D is unique. Up to multiplication by unit of R. And this is something that we've already seen in the principal, sorry, in the um, Euclidean domain. So, wait. Um, everything that works in a PID is automatically going to work in. Uh, in a Euclidean domain, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. 
because uh, you see the domains are um, yeah, as we're going to say, we to see later, they're kind of included in the um, PIDs. Right. And also, anything that's true of Euclidean domains, it only depends on the existence of greatest common divisors. Yep. You're going to be able to carry that over to PIDs. Yeah, that's the thing. I think that's where um uh, kind of gets um I mean in terms of um the Euclidean domain is where you just need to make sure the Euclidean division algorithm works. If that works, you're done. Um but um in a PID I believe it's it that works, but there's something else, you know, which is not going to be in uh, equivalent domain. So, uh, the proposition is that uh, every non-zero prime ideal in a PID is a maximal ideal, right? So, if your ideal is prime in a PID, it's a maximal ideal. So, I believe this is a very important proposition, which, uh, considering prime ideals are pretty important. But yeah, the thing is, like, the radicals are important too. I mean, why does he introduce them in a problem? Good lord. Because, uh, like, the Jacobson radical and the uh, Mill radical both deal with uh, these um, prime ideals. He kind of brags about that in the preface to the book <laughs> about how, how he likes introducing ideas in the exercises because okay. um, they might preview something that comes later in the book. Yeah, so also that... They also said sometimes he puts stuff in just because it didn't fit the flow of the chapter but it was too important to leave out. Ah, pretty contradictory. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're going to do that for enough things, like, you know, if, you know, if you have a student who doesn't like solving, um, problems, then you might as well just not learn anything. Um, <laughs> even the concept because you're included in the problems. Uh, yeah, I think that here you've, you've got to read all the problems whether you work them or not. Yeah. Just like how you saw primary ideas, ideals, and I hadn't even seen that because it was problem 40 and I hadn't gotten there yet. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I mean, that's why I kind of like Jacobson. If you go to, I, I, I brought this in paperback. Jacobson, like, um, goes to sections and he has like five to six problems for that section. And, I mean, that's, I mean, you can just like do a section and do the problems and then move on. But, I mean, here it's the same, but it's like 40 problems in a section. Like, how are you going to go to the next section? <laughs> But yeah, and also the fact that it's like uh, in Jacobson the problems are very hard, pretty much very hard. Um, so you know, it, it's not like you can skip those five problems, but uh, they're enough to make sure you have gone through the topic. So. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, I haven't tried like much of these baby problems in Dummit, but uh, I have kind of the sense that they would not take that long to do them. I mean, there are some which are very hard, but uh, the baby ones are not, I guess. Hmm. I guess. Let's see. So, every non zero prime ideal is a PID, sorry, in a PID is a maximal ideal, right? So, um, so P, uh, is a non-zero prime ideal in a PID, um, and I is some other ideal generated by M, which is also principal, of course, everything is principal, and it contains the non-zero prime ideal. So, we have to show that, um, I, 
is uh, we can generate the ideal i also from p, or we have to show that i is equal to the um, PIDR itself. Hmm. So um, P is um, in the ideal I, right? Um, so P can be written as um, RM because remember if P is in uh, the ideal, P um, divides M wait. Right, that's correct. Um, yeah. Hmm. So then, um, P can be written as R M, right? So a multiple of M. Um. Since uh, the gener the ideal generated by P is a prime one, um, and R M is also an ideal generated by P because you know that's P itself. Um, either R must be in the prime ideal or M must be in the prime ideal, right? Because their product is in there. Um, so if M is in the prime ideal, then uh, the ideal generated by P has to be equal to the ideal generated by M. Um, that is I. Hmm. Right. Okay. Ah, uh, it's a prime ideal. Okay, that makes sense. Um, um, on the other hand, if R is in P, uh, sorry, R is in the prime ideal, uh, then we can write R is equal to P times some S, um, because R must uh, be a multiple of P, right? Hmm. In this case, um, P is equal to R M is equal to um, yeah, P is equal to RM from before, and you can write RM as, okay. P is equal to RM is equal to PSM, okay. So SM is equal to 1. We call that R as an integral domain, so you can have cancellation there. So SM is equal to 1. So M is a unit, um, thus I has to be the whole, um, the ID itself that makes sense. Mm, okay, so, um, if you have a polynomial ring of a field. Okay, um, then it's going to be an Euclidean domain, um, but as it's an Euclidean domain, it's also a principal domain. Wait, yeah, if it's an Euclidean domain, you can say that it's a uh, PID. Okay, the converse is also true. The converse is true in this case, but it's not true in general. Uh, that if you have a PID, it doesn't have to be put in. So, the corollary is that if R is in a commutator ring, the polynomial ring uh, of the uh, of that commutator ring is a PID or a Euclidean domain, uh, then R has to be a PID. And this uh, makes sense uh, because, you know, if uh, R is a PID, um, R, so the polynomial ring is a PID, then R is a subring of the polynomial ring, right? Then R must be an integral domain, right? Every subring of a PID has to be the has to be an integral domain at least. Um, yeah. So the ideal um, of generated by X is a non-zero prime ideal uh, in the polynomial ring because. Um, the polynomial ring mod x is isomorphic to the integral domain R. Mm -hmm. I'm not too sure about that, but okay. 
So then by You're kind of modding out by all sorry, you're modding out by all the oh. polynomials that have zero constant term. Okay. Yeah, because you know you're modding it out by this ideal, this prime ideal. Okay. Hmm. Um, so by this proposition that we just said, um, it's a maximal ideal because, um, you know, um, every non prime, every prime ideal in a PID is maximal. This is an ideal, this is prime in the polynomial ring. Um, so, yeah, so it's a maximal ideal as the quotient, um, R, um, is a field which we have um so shown before right um okay cool so then uh, he talks a bit about the Dedekin has a norm um I hope it has nothing to do with uh much later. Uh yeah. And JP assures it also facts so that's nice. Okay, so this part is not something that we're going to go to, but yeah, it's kind of like um, a counter example where, um, you know, um, it's not always possible to have the Euclidean condition um, over the ID. Okay. And he gives this example um, related to that. Okay, this time less exercises. Um, let's go to this section. Um, you have these, so it's the last section. Oh, not too bad. I guess we can do this. Mm -hmm. So you have these. So you have these are kind of like uh, much more um, larger, which would include a PID, right? So um, this is um, a way of doing factorization, right? Um, kind of like an abstract uh, version of factorization. So. Um, yeah, so the main thing is that every PID is uh, EFP. So um, if you have uh, an integral domain um, and you take a non-unit element from R, then R is irreducible in the ring, so in the integral domain, uh, whenever uh, R can be written as uh, a product of two elements. Um, Sorry, yeah, whenever you write R as a product of two elements, uh, then at least um, A must be a unit in R, or B must be um, a unit, unit in R, right? So, um, is the thing is, like, R is not a unit, so if you can write R as a product of two elements, then both of them cannot be a units, but at least one of them has to be a unit of R. Otherwise, uh, your um, your element R is reducible, and this is important. Your reducible elements come up later uh, when we are going to do more stuff with prime ideals and stuff um, in our modules lectures. Like we're going to have modules over PIDs, um, we might need uh, reducible elements there, and even in a Tiha, I believe. Um, Bring some new things. Okay. 
So, um, um, and, um, a non-zero element P is going to be prime if the ideal generated by this P, um, is a prime ideal. Okay. So, so, yeah, it, like, it's, it's, it's going to be prime if it's, um, first of all, not a unit, and whenever it divides, uh, the, a product of two, um, elements, uh, you're going to divide either one of them, which cannot divide both, and it makes a lot of sense when you, when you see that in terms of integers and numbers, like primes cannot divide um, two elements of a product, two numbers in a product. So, two elements A and B of R, um, differing by a unit, are said to be associate uh, in R. I mean, yeah, if you can write uh, two elements, um, like if you have two elements A and B, and you can write A as U times B, where U is some unit, so they are uh, kind of all these notions. Yeah, this is just terminology, but important terminology. Um, so, um, proposition um, 10 is that in an integral domain, a prime element is always irreducible, and this is not hard to see. Um, you know, for example, if we have P and um, an ideal generated by them is a prime ideal, and P can be written as product of two um, elements A and B, then um, mm, okay, wait. You have uh, an ideal, uh, a prime ideal, okay. And P is the product of two elements, okay. So AB equals, AB is in the ideal, yeah. So by definition of a prime ideal, if your product is in there, um, you know, um, your, L, like, ah. Oh. Mm hmm. It's like, you know, both of those elements cannot be in the ideal, so either A is in the ideal or B. Um, so if A is there, you can write A is equal to PR for some R. Um, that implies uh, P is equal to um, AB is equal to, you know, um, A is PR, so PRB. Again, everything is an integral domain. Um, so you can cancel stuff so that RB is 1, thus B is a unit, and thus P is irreducible. But it's not the other way around, so you have irreducible elements that are not necessarily prime. The counterexample is right here. Now, if you consider the element 3 in the quadratic integer ring R, um, you know, V of root minus 5, um, we have done the computation you now before. Um, when we were talking about principal, sorry, when we were talking about the Euclidean domains, um, you know, you can show that uh, 3 is irreducible in R. But 3 is not a prime because uh, when you um, do the norm, that's when you have 2 plus root over of minus 5, 3 minus root over of minus 5, and you uh, multiply them, that's 2 squared, and that is divisible by 3. So that's a product of two elements that is divisible by 3. Um, but that's not possible if it's a prime. Right, so this um, it was kind of um, interesting to look at it uh, from the number analog analog the analogy with the number theory. You know, um, the prime does not divide the, um, anything else in the uh, in the number. Okay. So there's this uh, proposition as well. So if um, you have a PID, um, a non-zero element is prime if and only if it is irreducible. Right. So this is in the case of a PID. This was just an integral domain. In integral domains, you have uh, one way from prime you can get irreducibility, but to get the other way around, 
you will need a PID. Right? So this um, was interesting because we were dealing with prime and irreducible ideals and that uh, last problem of uh, from Bobalki and well yeah. So yeah, what does this say? The proof is that um you have to show it the other way around. The 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 forward directness straightforward because every uh, everything in a PID is a uh, integral domain. So if you have a prime, then it's always going to imply it's irreducible. So we have to prove the other way around. Um, right. So if you have some ideal that contains um, um, the ideal generated by P. Right, so we have an ideal M that contains the ideal generated by P. Um, then by hypothesis, um, the ideal by generated by M is a principal ideal. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, the thing is, every ideal in PID is a principal ideal, so this is also a principal ideal generated by some element M. Um, so, um, this ideal P is um, contained in this principal ideal, so um, you can write P in terms of some multiple of M, so P equals to RM, but P is irreducible, remember? Um, so, by definition, um, either R is a unit or M is a unit. Okay? So this means either the ideal generated by P is equal to the ideal generated by M or the ideal generated by M is just the unit of the right? um, Because of uh, these two um, possibilities. So thus the only ideals containing are the uh, prime ideals, so we be I mean, the claim to be a prime ideal, the ideal generated by P, uh, are just itself and the unit ideal. And that is the definition for it to be a maximal ideal. Right? And since maximal ideals are prime, so, no, that's, that's, the proof is complete. Yeah, I believe this is making sense, not too much to, um, a bit confused about. We're going to see uh, you what a UFD is from here. But yeah, he gives um, it to a lot of examples. Let's see. Hmm. Ah, okay. So you have the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Interesting. Okay, let's see. Yeah, this section on um, the Gaussian integer seems um, quite long. Let's see. Yeah, the rest is just qualities and examples. Yeah. Which we can skip because they're all really late. Um, let's see. So, um, this was the proposition um, about if you have prime um, ideals in a PID, then um, they have to be reducible and the other way around. And you have a few examples of this in the Z. And the of uh, the polynomial ring, um, sorry, the quadratic integer ring, uh, root uh, minus five. But uh, he gives 
kind of um I believe um the motivation behind introducing uh UFDs. Okay. In the integers, um, any integer n can be written as a product of primes. Um, yeah. Um, if n is not itself prime, then by definition it is possible to write n1, n2, uh, the two other integers n1 and n2, neither of which is a unit. Right? Okay. He is uh, introducing the uh, idea of uh, prime factorization, right? So if your n is 2,210, uh, you can use the same process. Right? So n itself is not prime, of course. So you can write n as 2 times uh, 1,105, right? The integer 2 is a prime, but the other one is not. So you know you can further write 1,105 in terms of some product of primes. The integer 5 is prime, but the other one is not, so you continue there. Uh, 221 is just 13 times 7, and here both of them are fine, right? So you stop there. The algorithm terminates. Um, this is just prime factor factorization that you do in what, middle school. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is the prime factorization of the number 2210. Um, Right, so you, you can uh, do the same for the other number, 1131, right? Um, yeah, but the thing is, in Z, you have the special condition that this decomposition of prime factors, right? So if you follow this algorithm and you do this, you know, lawfully, in the sense that, you know, you uh, terminate until you cannot further break down the primes, uh, the non-primes, that is you run out of primes, then uh, this this uh, kind of um, decomposition is unique, right? So um, any two prime factorizations of the same number, the same positive integer, um, only differ in the way you write the primes. The primes themselves, the numbers themselves, and the factorization are not going to differ. Right? So they are going to be the same. Um. Yeah. Okay. So, UFD uh, is an integral domain in which um, every non-zero element, um, which is not a unit, has these two properties, right? So it can be written as a finite product of irreducible PIs. Remember, we do not have a notion of prime in an abstract integral domain, right? We just know we have um, stuff uh, generated by elements and they can be prime ideals, but um, yeah. Um, so that's um, the first condition. The second condition is that the decomposition uh, that you get after you know writing the R as a finite product of irreducibles, this is unique up to associates. So associates, in the sense that, so if you can write R as like uh, another uh, in terms of another factorization, um, then uh, this. Um, Yeah, so it's like, you know, you're going to have, um, the, these irreducibles as associates. Right? So I'm not sure how that works, but, wait. If R is equal to Q1, Q2 up to Qm, is another factorization of R into irreducibles, then M is equal to N. Yeah, M has to be equal to N, right? So the number of irreducibles cannot be uh, changed. And there is some 
renumbering of the factors so that pi is associated to qi for all the uh, indices i. Right. Makes sense. And you have a few examples of this, um, which we're not going to discuss. Um, there are some interesting examples. Uh, the first one is trivial. Um, F, which is a field, is uh, UFD, right? Um, the other examples, they have the Gaussian integers again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The quadratic integer ring. Mm -hmm. So every ideal in the quadratic integer ring can be written uniquely as a product of prime ideals. Okay. Hmm. Okay. The unique factorization of ideals is the product of prime ideals. Both in general for rings of integers of algebraic number of fields. Algebraic number of fields. Ah, uh -huh. okay. Leads to the notion of the Dedekind domain, which is central in algebraic number theory, and also something we're going to do late. Now, um, commutative algebra, part of the course. Yeah. So let's see um some propositions of this um which are important. Uh the so proposition twelve is about how uh, in a UFD a non zero element is a prime if and only if it is irreducible. So it works in a PID. Um, but I see in a UFD. The proof is nothing too difficult. You just have to, um, try and write the primes, um, and, uh, sorry, the uh, factorization of the primes in terms of the irreducible, and then you will have to show that these irreducibles are um, you know are going to be uh, associate of the others right so I believe there's nothing else to this more than that Mm -hmm. Okay, so in a UFD, uh, the primes and the reducibles are um, interchangeable. Okay. So the next proposition is uh, if you have two elements of, a, of the UFD um, and you suppose uh, you know, there are two um, prime factorizations of them, mm -hmm. and U and B. Are uh, units. The primes of P1 till Pn are distinct, and the exponents are all positive. Right? So then the element D, which is like the product of all the um, um, irreducibles Pi. Sorry, all the primes. I mean, it's the same thing. All the uh, primes with their minimum exponents um, than P is the GCD and this is exactly what you do in middle school when you're trying to you know find the GCD by you know writing the prime factorization then picking out the um, lowest um, exponents of all the primes and then multiplying them to get the GCD <laughs> Except uh, back then, your teacher probably didn't tell you why you do this, um, but you know now you know why you do it because it's a unique factorization domain. 
<laughs> this reminds me of Gauss, to be honest. You know, Gauss was the guy who would, who would like ask stuff, uh, and uh, and he was like way ahead of his class. You know? uh, like his teacher would like give him tasks, to, expecting him to not being able to understand them, but um, he would do them. And yeah, if you're someone in middle school, um, um, and you ask like. Um, do you know what a unique actualization domain is? We're going to be a couple of ah. Okay, so we're going to see a proof for this. Um, this is kind of important. So let's see. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, D, um, has, um, like, the primes in D are like are the exponents of the primes are um, less than the exponents of um, A and B, right? So that means D must uh, divide both A and B, right? So all the primes that you have in D are included um, in A and B. Um, we have to show that it's a GCD. So you have any common divisor of A and B? C, you write C in terms of its prime factorization using Q. So you have C equal to Q1, G1 up until Qm, Gm. It's a prime factorization. Since um, each Qi must divide C, that's because it's a prime factorization, so it must also divide A and B, right? Um, so um, from the previous proposition, as we said, you know, and you're going to have the um, um, have an association between the uh, primes. So um, um, QI must divide um, one of the primes PT. Right? That's um, that makes sense. Uh, in particular, up to associates, also up to multiplication by unit. Um, the primes occurring in this um, common divisor must be a subset of the primes occurring in an MD. That also makes sense. Um, similarly, um, the exponents of the primes occur prime for the primes occurring in C must be no larger than those occurring in um, D. Right, because uh, D itself contains um, uh, the minimum of all the exponents of primes in here, and as this is a subset of this, so uh, it cannot be larger than um, in this one. So because this is the uh, okay, so this implies that C divides D. Okay, if C divides D, then um mm -hmm. D is the D C D, right? Hmm. I mean yeah, if that that was the proposition that we had back then, right? If you have another common divisor that divides both the elements, then it must divide the D C D of those elements. Makes sense. Yeah, that's 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 uh, 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 that's a uh, fair observation. Um, he's trying to um, get us used to the concept of EFDs and PIDs by looking at the GCDs and how it looks in there. So this example is just uh, trying to compute the GCD in there to this method and you know, trying to show how the prime factorizations work. Um, it's basic. Uh, theorem 14 says that every PID is a UFD, so that's a big thing, and in particular, every Euclidean domain is also a UFD. Um, and this proof seems pretty um, big.
Okay. So let's see if we can go to this pool. Um, it doesn't look bad, the pool, but let's see. Um, yeah, if you can prove the first assertion, then the second one just follow from there because every Euclidean domain is, um, PID. Um, okay, so you take a PID, you take a non zero element of that. Um, which is not a unit, so you have to show that R can be written as a finite product of irreducible elements of R. Um, you know, and we have to show that you know, they are unique up to um, associates. Right. Hmm. So if R is itself irreducible, then of course it's going to be prime, and you know, uh, its decomposition is going to be um, up to um, units. But if it's not, then um, by definition, R can be written as the product of two elements, uh, neither of them being a unit. Right. So now, if both of these are irreducibles. Uh, then we are again done because it will be a current activation. But if um, they are not, um, at least one of them is reducible. Right? Um, thus, you know, if it's one of them is reducible, you can write that reducible element as the product of two other non-unit elements. Right? So you can repeat this process exactly what you do in prime factorization. Right? You repeat until you uh, you no longer have primes. Um, yeah. So from um, uh, you're, you're going to come to a point where this process terminates. Right? So you're going to have factors that are irreducible. Um, if this is not the case. Um, Mm-hmm. From the factorization R equals to R1, R2, we obtain a proper inclusion of ideals. Okay, so then the ideal generated by R1 is contained, contains the ideal generated by R. Okay. And you will have this chain of ideals, an infinite chain of ideals. Interesting. And all the um, containments of proper. Mm -hmm. hmm. Right. We have to now see if this um, chain is um, stable. Right, so if it um, becomes stationary, right, so it means that there is some odds of integer n such that i k is equal to i n for all um, k larger than n. Okay, so let's see. Um, mm -hmm. um, i is the union of all these ideals. Um, in the uh, chain, the ascending chain. Um. Okay. Yeah. It reminds me of that Bourbaki problem again. Chains. Um. Okay. So. Uh, I is an ideal. We have seen this before, how to prove the union of these uh, ideals in the chain is an ideal. Uh, so that's that. Um, now R is a PID, right? So um, it must be um, principally generated. So it has to be a principal ideal. Um, let's say it's generated by A. Um, so I is the union of ideals 
Um, so A must be the element of one of these ideals, right? Again, the same argument that we did before. You take an element of the ideal, it has to be contained in some part of the chain. Um, so um, A must be an element of some of the ideals in the chain. So let's say A is an I N. Uh, but then we have I N must be contained within I, uh, which is again an ideal generated by A. So I will be equal to I N. Okay? So um, the chain becomes stationary at I N. This proves that you know you cannot have this until um, infinity, right? Um, which means that the factorization has to terminate into irreducibles. Okay, does that make sense? I guess it does. Mm -hmm. So uh, then the last part is that uh, it's terminating, but um, we have to show that it, uh, the decomposition is unique, right? So for that you have to do the induction. Hmm. And the process is not that. Hard. It's just tedious to check for you know uh, associates. Uh, you have to check the associates. You have to cancel stuff because it's an integral domain. So you know this is all legal. Um, you can do that, and you'll see that you know it's uh, unique up to uh, units, right? And then you'll be done in proving that every principal domain, every PID. Is a UFD and every Euclidean domain is also a UFD. And then you have a few corollaries, which is the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Um, uh, it's, it's just um, showing that the integers are um, a unique representation domain, and because we know that Z is a Euclidean domain, so that's that. And there's this other section about Gaussian integers, which can be helpful to go through, but we will not have the time to go through. So, yeah. Y yeah, because it gives some idea about the formats theorem, so it can be interesting to go through. So, yeah, this is the summary. This is what you're going to take away from the lecture. Um, fields. Um, are kind of Euclidean domains. Euclidean domains are kind of principal ideal domains. Principal ideal domains are kind of um, um, we have these and we have these are integral domains. And with that, we are done for today's lecture. Ah, it was tiring, but okay. Hey, good job. You know, we didn't really start. I mean, we, this was pretty much two hours because we started fairly late. So, mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. Um, so this was the last lecture on ring theory. Um, next lecture would be again on group theory. And before we get there, we're going to do a review session on uh, reviewing uh, everything that we've done um, until now. So if you have any specific sections from everything that we've done now, uh, groups and rings that you want to go back to and talk about, um, let me know in the chat and we'll do that. And even if like we have some problems from previous pieces that we, uh, that you'd like to go to, let me know. Okay. And, well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, the course is not bad. And we're going pretty well. Um, if we keep this going and we get to the end, we're going to learn a lot. Yeah. Yep, we have the PZ uh, coming. I think I've wrote most of the PZ. I'll check again for the 
um, titles um, and stuff like that. I haven't added any optional problems, so I'll scroll through, go back here again, <laughs> just to get some other spicy stuff. I mean, yeah, the other ones are kind of straightforward, but not that straightforward. Um, yeah. Okay, so, um, I'm going to let you know when we're going to do the review session. It ha it will be somewhere around Monday or Sunday. I'm not sure about the time. It will be the same time as we do the lectures. So, yeah, we'll do the review and then I'll post the PDF in a few hours from now. So, yeah, thanks everyone for joining. See ya in the review session. Mm-hmm.